Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope that everybody is getting their day off and their week off to a great start. As for me, busy as usual, there's so much going on. Um, we are getting progress as far as the work we're doing with uh, the young mother of four that I've been telling you about. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the person who runs the business, she's actually a client of mine. Uh, she runs a business at the destination, the place that we're sending this lady and her children to. She's going to be on with me live, not to really talk about that, but to talk about some issues she feels is pertinent in the black community among health and black women. And she kind of called me up, uh, called me out yesterday when we were doing our session. And she asked me, hey, your wife doesn't have a channel talking about Marion. And. She said, no disrespect, Dr. Wallace, but sometimes you're just too nice. You know, Miss Marion, you know, she just tells it how she feels from the heart. And I explained why I operate the way I operate. And my, my goal is, one, uh, first and foremost, to reach people and provide them with solutions. And people tend not to take what you're bringing if you're sharp and rugged. Sometimes people need to hear that. But the way I work, it doesn't work for me because I'm trying to get deeper. I'm not just trying to drop something off and say, hey, hey, you need to check yourself. I'm trying to say, hey, you need to check yourself. Let me help you. And so I work differently. Now, if you look at some of the responses, when people get under my skin, I can come hard. But that that's the evolution of Rick Wallace is that the 20-something-year-old and 30-something-year-old would be off in everybody's grill, um, you know, checking anything I felt was moving against me and I don't do that anymore most of the times you'll notice you never even see me come back to videos after I do them because I'm not there to argue my point I've put 30 years of research in what I'm delivering and I'll let it stand every now and then I'll see something and I think it's off base and I'll address it um, but anyway she's gonna come on and we're gonna talk and I'll let you get to know a little bit about her and we'll talk about what we are doing for uh, this young woman, but mostly we're going to talk about what she feels about health in the black community um, and a frame of mind that troubles her because she's talking about female, black female employees that work for her and other others she observed and she really is looking to talk about it. So we're going to do that. But uh, I'm here yesterday. I did a real impromptu video based off of something somebody asked me. And the answer I gave them at the time was a real nonchalant, kind of facetious and sarcastic answer. Then I thought about it and it was actually sort of kind of profound because it was true. And so what happened is I, I, I did a video that says why I don't like. I didn't say hate. I said I don't like Candace Owens. And I followed that with she's too smart to be that dumb. And I went on to talk about why I said that. I talk about how when she wants to make a point on something as complex as geopolitics, she is well-researched, she is highly articulate, and she is completely aware of all of the components. And, you know, that tells me she's highly intelligent. But then she'll come around and say something as asinine as racism isn't an issue in America. And there's all this data out there, empirical data and ongoing studies that reveals that race does play a role and that we're operating in a racial class system. Now, if she would do, say something as simple, if she would make just the slightest variation, there's racism in America, but that can't be an excuse for failure. I'm right on there with you. And I get uh, accused of being uh, in bed with the Democrats anytime I speak against a conservative's point of view. I'm actually highly conservative, far more conservative in my thoughts and thinking than I am liberal. Um, 
And I literally loathe Democrats. I ain't a fan of Republicans, but I literally loathe Democrats because I've seen what they've done to our communities over the years. While constantly yelling racism and pointing at the Republicans, they've been doing us dirty and rubbing us raw all the time. I know the I know the history. I've done the research. I've looked into it from a sociological, psychological, economical, uh, and, and, and and other ways. So I know it. So I'm not in any way pushing a democrat a demo, a, a de agenda for the democrats i'm pushing an agenda for the betterment and empowerment of black people so i have to be aware of the total truth not just my bias or feelings and that's what i want to point out in this video because there are a couple of people that came and i'm gonna address two so i can address the general supposition okay uh one person came on and accuse me of deleting all of the positive uh, assessments of Candace Owens when they are there. Never touched them. I don't delete comments of people who disagree with me. Anybody who has followed me for any time will be aware of the fact that I invite people to disagree. I invite opposing opinions. There's only a couple of rules. Do not be disrespectful or derogatory. That simple. And I also ask that you be well informed and not speaking from your feelings, that you actually have something to back your particular position outside of how you feel or what you heard someone else say. I'm real big on reading and research. I'm real big on critical thought, critical thinking. So those are the only things I don't remove. Now, if you come at me sideways calling me a simp because of how I choose to handle black women, yeah, I'm going to delete your thing and probably delete you. Uh, and I'm not going to even get into that. I'm going to address the whole simp thing and I'm going to tell you why it's so detrimental to the black to black progress. And I'm going to tell you the type of people who use that term. But that's not for today. Today, so that person accused me of that and then, you know, chastised me for it, you know, shame on you. I'm unsubscribing. Well, all I saw was I'm I just unsubscribed. So I was coming to tell them bye because I was thinking you unsubscribed because I said I didn't like Candace Owens. I got a right to like who I want to like. And uh, she was actually unsubscribing because she felt like I was manipulating the conversation. Now, if it would have been an accurate assessment, that would be kind of shady. You know, I'm taking away anything that doesn't align with what I said. And that's not how I operate. Go back and look at my videos. It's some people on there bringing hard. I mean, coming hard at what I say. And most of the time, I don't even respond to it because I've done the work. And most of the times, the responses are on the lines of superficial observation or the regurgitation of what someone else said. So I'm not, I, um, I, re I remember the first time I saw the video of Dr. John Henry Clark, where he said, I only debate my equals, all others I teach. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh, that's savage. And then I said, man, that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, arrogant. But then I started to evaluate it and I gained an understanding of what he was saying. He wasn't being arrogant at all. What he was simply saying is, if you haven't done the level of, of research that I've done, if you haven't put the amount of time, energy, and effort and reviewed the material that I've reviewed, we can't have an educated, informed discussion or debate about it because where you are making your point from doesn't include all the other hundreds of things I'm considering in making my point. There's no way to, to, to debate that. We're operating from two points of awareness. So we can't do that. So I don't make it a point of coming and arguing with people who, and what I can tell you is, what you won't find are highly informed people really coming at me because I'm stating facts, not just the facts that make my point, the whole facts. I never sit up and say black people are stuck and can't make it. Matter of fact, one of the only things that Dr. Uh, Claude Anderson and I have disagreed on is that blacks are permanently uh encased in uh at the lowest rung of the socioeconomic letter or as he put it uh have become a permanent underclass now i understand where he's coming from i understand the numbers i see the economics i see the dynamic i see the social dynamic i see it all i'm just never going to be a person that believes i can't do something 
And I don't think that I'm unique to my people. I think that I've taken a different approach to life based off of the influences I've had. I'm no better than anyone else. So if I can do it, they can do it. It's just trying to find a way to convince them, trying to change their thought processes, trying to change their approaches and getting them involved in being a positive influence in their own lives instead of looking outside of themselves and asking people to help. Now, in a lot of ways, some of, the, some of that is in direct correspondence with what Candace Owens thinks. My issue with Candace is your gaslighting anytime you say that racism doesn't exist or racism doesn't play a role because I can show you a hundred different ways that it does right now today. I can show you uh, meticulously through data the variances that are present. Now, is that an excuse for blacks not to perform? No. I don't know about those of you who are my age, but I came up in a household where I was taught because you're black, you're going to have to be three times better. You're going to have to excel at a level that your white contemporaries are not in order to even be noticed and given an opportunity in everything except sports and entertainment. And still, there are variables that play out in that as well. Uh, there are definitely politics and racism in sports as well. But in life in general, there are going to be things you're just simply going to have to overcome. But it was followed up with, that's okay, son. You can do it. You're capable. And that was the thing. I was, I was aware that I had obstacles in front of me, but I was also aware that I was built to overcome them. So I'm not painting, I'm not ever painting racism as an excuse for us to be where we're at. I'm saying we need to be aware of it so we know how to deal with it. When you consistently tell somebody something doesn't exist, and yet they are still facing certain problems that can't be explained, they start to say, okay, then it's just me and there's nothing I can do about it because I'm trying. You have to be aware of the obstacle so that you can work through it, around it, go under it or over it or whatever you're going to do with it, but you've got to confront it. You can't pretend it's not there. That's my argument. That is why I think critical race theory is important not to cry racism not to cry oh whoa it's me not to sit up and talk about oh my god look at what white people are doing no but to sit up and say we've got something working against us what are we going to do about it then to go into critical thought if you look if you read any of my books you're going to find that i'm going to present the problem and then i'm going to present the solution i never am a person that's coming up to say man this i'm not that person i'm not a lecturer about everything wrong in the black community i'm a person that says we need to identify the things that are wrong and confront them we need to deal with the external forces or the exogenous forces. we need to also deal with endogenous issues there's a bunch going on anybody who has followed me has also heard me say that the biggest issues are within. Why? Because I believe in the old African proverb that says if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. That if we are really truly who we should be, if we get a sense of who we should be and become that, then what's going on the outside will not matter. The problem is we are suffering from an identity crisis. That's the first thing. But that person came in and accused me of manipulating. And I came back and pointed out, no, I did not. I told them, have a nice day. You know, uh, you're more than free to leave, you know, take your subscription and go. They come back and they talk about everything else except the fact that they were wrong about their assessment. And th that's what normally happens when you're in your motion. Then somebody else comes along again, proving they're in their emotions and can't and can't really truly uh, comprehend or interpret. So. And they accused me of saying that, well, basically, I think they said something like, so she articulately uh, expresses her view, but because you disagree with it, she's dumb. Now, nowhere in that video is that what I said. Number one is, I never called her dumb. I used a play on words that says she's smart. I, in my video, acknowledged how intelligent she is. And so I used that to say it's, the, the word dumb was a play on, a play on words to talk about exactly what she's doing you can't be that smart and be this dumb you can't be that smart and be totally ignorant of this this particular situation so that tells me you actually know 
the variables that point to racism and you are purposely ignoring them because they don't play into your point. As a scientist, and this is what I want to put on you, I want to teach you a little something. I hope, hope people will watch this. This isn't the sensational stuff about who talking about who and who said what about what. But this is how we need to think and this is how we need to learn. This is how you develop the, the mindset for critical thought. Okay, I don't enter into anything so to support my body. So when I, when I start research, I'm not looking to support my personal bias. Matter of fact, the first thing I do when conducting research is to look for data that contradicts my belief. That automatically starts a process that makes me view other points of view and to dig into it. Now here's how research works. You have to actually put out research. So for someone to say, say racism doesn't exist, they have to have a foundation of data that proves that blacks have equal footing with all other races, especially whites, and that there are no mechanisms, systemic mechanisms in place that work against blacks. And in order to do that, they would have to sit up, they could present all the stuff that they believe, but they were also by the very laws of scientific method, have to review all of the data that says there is racism. And then they would have to systematically disprove each point. You would have to say that redlining didn't and never, does not and never existed. You would have to say that gentrification isn't, isn't an influence. You would have to say that miseducation isn't an influence. You would have to say that the perpetuation of um, untreated trauma from slavery on down and also the traumatic re-injury that we consistently experience by the new things we go through while never having dealt with the old things is an issue. Then you would have to examine uh, the result of taking a, a people's identity away, taking their religion, their spiritual faith, their name, their history away from them and then subjecting them to 200 plus years of chattel servitude where they have no rights not the right to marry now if you look at uh, and, and, and I love the uh, the the argument that's often made every at some point in history everybody's been enslaved nobody's been enslaved in the way that those in the Caribbean and the Americas have uh, especially North America the US specifically chattel slavery is the worst form of uh, enslavement that has ever existed even during slavery during the transatlantic slave trade those in say for for instance in brazil they had they had human rights they were allowed to marry their marriages were respected their families were kept intact we're not going to talk about that part of it the fact that families weren't kept intact we're not going to talk about the fact that even when blacks tried to build economic enclaves like Tulsa, like Slocum, like Rosewood, like Wilmington, North Carolina, like East St. Louis, and so many more, that they were they were bombed, they were burnt, people were killed. We're not gonna talk about the 70 years of Jim Crow segregation where we were blocked out. And not only that, we were lynched for things as simple as looking at a white man in the eye. We're not gonna talk about that. These are things that not, are not even 100 years gone yet. And then we could talk about the new things. Then, and I'm not saying that proves racism. Understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that proves racism. But what I'm saying is before you can say racism doesn't exist, you got to give an answer for that. There's also a thing called statistical significance in scientific method. What it says is that when something reaches a certain level of persistency or consistency in reality, in whatever study you're doing, and it cannot be explained away by simple variance or coincidence. It's called statistically being st st statistically significant, and it demands an explanation. In other words, it didn't just happen. You don't have the vast majority of blacks living at a, a certain level or having a huge gap in wealth that's actually widening, where uh, depending on what study you study, the median uh, household wealth for whites is somewhere around 133 to 144, depending on the study. Anywhere from 5,000 to 7,000 or less in the black community. And it's widening. And there is a concern that if we don't do something different, that uh, we can be completely economically 
uh, null and void, for a lack of a better term. Uh, so you have to evaluate that. What am I getting at is you can't have your conversation about something without looking at all of the variables. You don't get to pick and choose your points to sure up your argument. You have to look at it all. And I am willing to admit that there are a bunch of things that we as a people need to focus on. There are a bunch of things that we as a people. There's also somebody that came in and said that the reason that immigrants come to this country and thrive and surpass blacks is simply because they come in, they remain focused, and they get it done. And I'm pretty sure the person who said that never ever considered the fact that the people who come here as immigrants come with a culture ingrained, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. They have a community that they belong to, whether they are Cambodian, whether they are Vietnamese, whether they are Jamaican, whatever, they come with a sense of of having their own identity and culture and a people they belong to where they come in, where we have had individualism ingrained in our minds for decades, even centuries, where everything is about us surviving individually. There's no unity. And even uh, J. Hedger Hoover said the greatest uh, threat to national security is black unity. Why would black unity be a threat to national security? You have to answer that question. You have, see what I'm saying? You've got to answer questions that people don't want to answer who talk about slavery. I mean, not sl slavery no longer has an impact. It's been 156 years. And I can show you study upon study and studies I've done and written on that show that adverse childhood experiences alone last a lifetime. I can show you again studies I've done on epigenetics that show that you can pass that trauma down genetically and predispose your progeny to being traumatized, meaning that when they experience a traumatic event, they are more likely to be traumatized by it than a person who didn't have those same genetic markers passed down to them. I can talk about how epigenetically it impacts health over time that trauma and stress and all of the things that come along with poverty have an impact on your genetic function that stress will upregulate disease genes leading to heart disease leading to cancer leading to so many other things while the lack of stress will upregulate healing genes literally you are designed to heal yourself when you eat right when you have the right mindset all of these things matter so if you keep somebody in a constant state of stress what, what happens first and foremost is they constantly have cortisol in their system cortisol is a stress hormone adrenaline is a stress performance hormone they are meant to be in the body for short periods of time to respond to threat that's where they, this initially had the limbic system, limbic system triggers the body that there's a threat present. You know, probably way back when we're talking about big, large animals, you know, running around and you're trying to be out there and there's something out there that can literally take your life like that. You got to fight. Am I going to stand and fight or am I going to run? That's what they call it, fight or flight. Uh, but imagine being in fight or flight all the time. Do I believe, uh, again, here's a point, and, 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 and they say I disagree. Actually, everything that Candace Owen, Ar Owens articulated about the geopolitics surrounding China, I 100% agree, agree with. I've actually been talking about it for the last six years. Nobody listens to me. Nobody's talking about what China's doing in Nigeria. So, I, 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 But see, that's why I know she's smart enough to know that there's data out there that contradicts her stance on racism. And the crazy thing is, anybody that comes to defend us never addresses all of this stuff. And see, in order for you to have a real true stance on it, you're going to have to address it. Or you're just talking about what you feel. And you're taking on an idea that sounds good to you or a, a system. But see, in science, without being able to really truly develop with real true data an idea, it never even becomes a concept much less a hypothesis 
definitely not a theory and will never reach theorem. Theorem is the proven theory. Theory is where most of the world operates. But it's not just an idea. Most people say, I have a theory. No, you have an idea. A theory has been developed. It has taken real true facts, real true realities that can be studied and measured. And here's the other thing. Studies have to be done in a way and recorded in a way that they can be duplicated so that people can check your work. See, if I go out and say, I did this here, but there's no way to redo, to redo the study and see how the results come up, then it really wasn't a study. It was you compiling information and setting up things to produce the answer you want. That's why you got to be very careful of biases. That's why I give more weight to independent studies than I do financed and funded studies by parties who have a horse in the race. If I'm giving you a billion dollars to do research and my position is that this particular thing is healthy, what do you think your research is going to lean towards trying to prove? Because if I gave you that funding, I'm probably going to be willing to fund something else and probably made a promise. Depending on how this study turns out, I, I may be willing to fund more of your work. Now, you may have work that has nothing to do with the study they're asking you to do, but you can't get funding for it. Now, here they come and they tell you basically if you kind of, you know, make me look good in your study, I'm going to fund that for you. No strings attached, but the strings were already there. That's why you got to be careful. So my whole thing is not being dismissive of anyone. And, and I love the fact that if you disagree with a conservative, you are automatically labeled a liberal. I'm not a liberal. My views are highly conservative. I think the government is way too involved in the uh, happenings and the movement of the people. I think that uh, social programs have crippled my community. So I'm not that person. But I don't believe that uh, you're going to sit up and get me to say that I didn't see what the Republicans did to the black communities in the 70s and the 80s. I saw that too. I saw what the Democrats did in the 60s and I saw what the Democrats did in the 90s. And I've seen what happened in eight years of uh, uh, Obama leadership. So no, I'm not a fan of Obama, but I'm not stupid enough to believe that I can depend on the Republicans. What I believe is blacks have to be able to develop within themselves an economic floor on which they can build and stand. It's on that economic floor that you are able to begin then leveraging your economic power to produce the results you want. You are going to have to learn how to play the game. Or you're going to have to learn how to operate completely outside of it without it. But you cannot go into a system thinking that they're going to teach you and show you how to take their position and take their wealth. I tell people all the time, racism isn't the end game. I said that a long time ago. Racism is simply the, simply the guardian of the gate to elitism. The extremely wealthy protecting their wealth and using the middle class as a buffer and protector. That is what's happening. And I could go in detail and explain it. I've done it. Uh, but that's it. So I just had to come back and touch on that. Because I, I, what I decided, I'm not getting into the comment fields anymore. I'm not doing that. Um, you know, but And I, I didn't want to do a live because I, I didn't want to sit up and go back and forth with nobody in the chat. Um, those who want to hear truth unadulterated. And again, be able to disagree with me. But you're gonna have to grapple with the facts. You don't have to. You don't have to accept my interpretation. But you're gonna have to grapple with the facts. That's all I'm asking. I'm asking you to look at the facts in totality. I'm saying stop cherry picking. To make your point, and let's talk about the totality of it all. And I love to see people quoting Martin Luther King, but forgetting that last year where he started to talk about economic responsibility of the United States and they don't want to talk about the fact that that got him killed and they don't want to talk about the fact that in 1999 the United States government was found guilty and culpable in a civil court for being responsible for his death nobody wants to talk about why would they all of a sudden a person that they've been underwriting the whole LBJ administration they've been underwriting him all of a sudden, he stops talking about uh, integration 
and he starts talking about reparations and in less than a year he's dead then we find out that you were directly responsible for it so that tells me there's something there you don't kill a person that doesn't have the grounds for what he's saying or doing what you did is you made him a buffer for years he kept us going on the emotion he kept us fighting for integration not realizing at the same time we're giving up things we already own to patronize people who would never let us be a complete part of what they're doing. And when he realized it, he said, I think we've integrated into a burning house and he changed. And when he changed his philosophy and he started talking about economic responsibility, he started talking about reparations, he started talking about we're coming to get our check. He became a liability and the the court records are there if you want to see what happened in the court in 99 i even believe that his video i know i saw the video uh i haven't seen it lately but i saw the video it's like a a, a number of videos that make up the complete ca uh case or the complete trial and the u.s government was found culpable the way they went about it was vicious I mean, it's it's not it wasn't it, it wasn't like okay, you know, we're gonna just kind of put him out there and we're gonna spread the word and hopefully somebody. They set it in motion. So with that being said, look, I'm gonna get off here. I got a lot of things to get ready for. Uh, matter of fact, I'm coming back with a live stream um, in about a what hour and a half. So I got a, a bunch of other stuff I need to get done prior to that. So I'm going to get off of here. But I just had to come back and kind of touch on that. Uh, and, and bring some clarity where I'm coming from. When I'm speaking, I'm not speaking for any anecdotal observation or superficial observation. I'm speaking for years and years of reading and researching and evaluating. And I've had to evolve in some of my thinking. I've had to put some blame where it belonged within the community. I've had to grow in this thing. But, you know, to sit up there and sit up and see someone with that level of intellect sit up and pretend that it's like you know totally non-existent people are just using it to rile you up it doesn't exist tell it to the person out there that's watching someone less comf uh less competent than them get a job that they're applying for or get a promotion that they deserve talk to them uh, talk to the people whose applications are looked over solely because their name appears ethnic. That's two studies, University of Michigan, University of Southern California. I can go on and on about stuff that's out there at that point. Talk to the families, who the black families, who home, whose comparable homes, homes that are comparable to white homes in the same area, are being undervalued in appraisals for resale. And that talk to some of them that actually waited a month, ordered another appraisal, took all of the indications of the black family out of the home, asked white friends to come in and sit in doing the appraisal, and the value went up. Ask the same families why their homes that under appraises for resale over appraises for tax assessment in the same same home. It, it appraises higher than white homes for taxes, but appraises lower than white homes for uh, resale. It's kind of hard to say that's a level playing field when you're talking about using home ownership as a wealth building mechanism. We could go on and on and on about things that need an answer. You've you got to have an answer for that. Is there an answer outside of that race is in the play? I think it's hard. I, uh, to say otherwise because there are no other distinguishing values in our other aspects the couples are equal except for the color of their skin now could it still be other variables I have to admit that because there's no absolute study on it to the depths of their studies being done there's plenty of articles being written all you gotta do is search it but you, but you have to admit that that's in play, that that's a real, and you have to at least visit it, study it, evaluate it, and provide an alternative answer outside of it being race. That's just one thing. There are literally hundreds. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you guys for stopping in. Um, 
I love all of you guys. Y'all don't have y'all y'all who roll with me know I'm passionate about what I do. I speak firmly about what I do because when I speak on it, I've literally invested a lot of time in tr gaining an understanding of it. So I feel strongly about my position in it. But those of you who follow me know I'm not beyond saying, man, I was wrong and coming back and openly on the same platform that I made the statement, making the apology and the retraction. I've done it more than one time. My ego isn't at play in here. I'm not here to get my ego stroked. I told you this before. I stroke my own ego with my own assessments of my growth, of where I come from. I don't need nobody to validate me. I don't need anybody to tell me who I am. I'm not here for that. I'm here because I believe I have something to offer. And so uh, subscribers are great to have because the more you get, the more reach you have. But I don't cry over them because that's not why I'm here. I'm here for people who actually want to learn. And I'm here to learn. So when, 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 when I interact with people, I want, I, want, I want to learn, but I'm definitely not going to respond to you coming at me sideways. Not in a way that you're going to like if I respond at all. So most of the time, I don't even come back to the videos because people are going to show up and they're going to talk on the surface of, with their emotions. Um, and here's one more thing. Whether you realize it or not, you're talking to a person who is an expert in human behavior. I break down conversation, whether written or verbal, and I can get all in your head and know where you're at, where you're coming from, and what you're doing. You say so much about yourself when you get on these platforms. And I'm not the only one doing it. People who are wanting to sell you stuff are doing it to you. It's, it's, it's people who are wanting to know how to get you to vote, if you vote at all, are doing it to you. You open up a lot of yourself when you get on. You know, ain't nothing wrong with exposing yourself when you know who you are and you're cool with it. But you better know that when you're coming at me, what you think you're presenting isn't what I'm getting. I'm getting what you do, what you really are. So it is what it is. Just know that. Uh, and all that being said, like I said, I'm not unteachable by anybody. Hell, my kids teach me stuff all the time. But, you know, I just had to come back and kind of deal with that. I just want to kind of lay out number one is what it takes to dismiss something on a scientific level where emotions aren't involved. It's not as easy as saying uh, and stop using the exception to explain away the reality of the collective. That person became a doctor. That person became a, 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 a multimillion a uh, millionaire business owner. They rep represent literally between one and three percent of the total collective. So what are we going to do about the other 90 percent? That's the rule. And so we need to look at the rule and understand why that is. You can't dismiss it. You can't use the exception to explain away the rule. There's always going to be exceptions. There's always going to be somebody that gets through the net. You go fishing. There's always going to be a fish gets through the net. What we need to figure out is how to get more fish through the net and, and stop acting like the net doesn't exist. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have a great day. And with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time, you know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group. I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.